Hi, this is Amy Perlau with the PolyBio Podcast, and my guest today is Dr. Kim Lewis. He is a university distinguished professor at Northeastern University with particular expertise in molecular microbiology. He's also the director of Northeastern's Antimicrobial Discovery Center. His laboratory studies persister cells responsible for tolerance to antibiotics, uncultured bacteria of the environment and the microbiome, and also works on drug discovery. And some of the work he's done on persister cell formation, antibiotic development, and use of pulse antibiotics involves Borrelia burgdorferi, the causative agent of Lyme disease. So with that, Kim, hello. Thank you so much for joining. Hello, Amy. Uh, my pleasure. Good to be here. Great. Well, let me jump into some questions. My, you know, overall, when I look at your work, you study how bacteria can often survive in the face of antibiotics, and then you innovate to see how you can better develop or use antibiotics in order to better target them or prevent that from happening. So on the side of the bacteria being able to withstand, at least in, in a small number, antibiotic treatment, could you tell me more about that? That's the persister cells that I was referring to. Sure, um, yes. Um, so uh, any population uh, of bacteria produces a small number of dormant cells. They are spore-like, if you will. Uh, so they don't do much. They don't have an active me metabolism. Uh, and so since uh, they are dormant, they become tolerant to killing uh, by antibiotics. Because antibiotics really uh, require uh, active functions that they can then uh, corrupt. If there is not much to corrupt, well, then antibiotics do not act. Uh, and, and so uh, it's not, you know, entirely, uh, it wasn't entirely obvious what, what to do about it because uh, uh, antibiotics that we have currently in the clinic, now they are not uh, particularly effective against uh, these persister cells. Uh, so uh, we've taken two approaches. One is, uh, you know, straightforward drug discovery to find uh, compounds that are going to be efficacious uh, against persister cells. Uh, we have one such compound in, in development. We published it in, in Nature several several years ago. This is uh, it has a long name, acylpeptide. Uh, so, uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't kill uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, a, a lot of antibiotics do not. That's sort of an issue. It kills, you know, staph. We're developing it against uh, uh, chronic staph infections. Uh, but at least that gives us uh, gives us hope. This is, you know. Uh, this is a, a useful precedent that such compounds uh, are uh, indeed uh, possible to discover. And the discovery program that we have around Lyme disease, of course, we're looking also for compounds that can kill persisters. So that's sort of one straightforward approach. Uh, another one uh, is uh, pulse dosing that we showed at least in a test tube uh, can work uh, even with regular antibiotics, uh, like for example, ceftriaxone, that do not uh, directly kill persister cells. So the idea is pretty simple. Uh, you uh, add antibiotic, it kills regular cells, persisters survive. And then you withdraw uh, antibiotic, essentially emulating what's happening in the body, because if you, know, let's say, I took a pill or an injection, now, and then uh, after a while, uh, the body will clear the antibiotic. Uh, and so then uh, persisters wake up, start regrowing. Uh, and if you hit them before, before the original population, if you hit them just at the moment when they started uh, regrowing, they're not persisters anymore, uh, they are going to die. Uh, so theoretically, with two doses of antibiotic, you're going to sterilize uh, the population. That in practice doesn't happen because persisters wake up uh, uh, each on their own schedule. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so this timeline is a little bit stretched out, uh, but in, in our experience, several cycles of this pulse dosing, they sterilize uh, Borrelia burgdorferi in the test tube. Uh, and so there is uh, uh, a possibility to do the same thing um, uh, in treatment, if there is indeed the lingering population uh, of the pathogen that messes things up uh, for patients. Wow, yes, that makes a huge, it's 
pulse dosing has always just made a huge amount of sense to me. Um, once you understand that bacteria, that a small number, like you said, of bacteria can persist despite the antibiotic treatment, then they, the, just to summarize, they begin to grow, regrow a little when the antibiotic is removed and they actually get out of that persist or dormant state. And then if you hit them again, is what you're saying at that point yeah. with a pulse dose, you get them when they're more vulnerable and you may be able to better eradicate, right? And so that- yeah. That is obviously a, an important trend in patients who are diagnosed with post-treatment or chronic Lyme disease. Um, so in other words, right now, um, is there, I guess one of the questions I have is, are, is there a difference in persister cell formation during, a, a, during an acute Lyme infection or a chronic one? For example, let's say someone gets bit by a tick and the organism is, the, it's, just, it's just been eight hours ago and the organism is, is in their system in a certain form, or there may be a different person who didn't realize that they had a tick bite and were sick for six months and the organism has been in their body for a while. Is there a difference in persister cell formation in those yeah, two a good different question. states? Yeah, that's, that, that, that's a good question. Uh, so in a population that is uh, rapid, relatively rapidly growing, you know, you know Borrelia burgdorferi doesn't grow rapidly, but it grows exponentially, meaning it, it will divide you know, every 13 hours, there will be a, a division. So while it is dividing um, uh, sort of on schedule, uh, the uh, ability to make persisters is, will be less than if it's not growing uh, rapidly. And so uh, if uh, in the body, it, let's say it's stuck somewhere where conditions are not very favorable for it, then more persisters are going to form. The less favorable conditions, more, the more persisters. That's really interesting. Okay, that makes sense. So in patients right now who get Lyme, they're given a course of doxycycline. And do you think there's a way to innovate that? Not saying that that's not a good first step, but that it might make sense to give people multiple antibiotics um, as part of, is, is, was that some, is that something you would think of doing if you were? You know, it's, 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 possi it's possible that, uh, again, uh, you know, if uh, the chronic stage, uh, involves, at least in some patients, uh, a lingering uh, population of pathogen, then sort of the harder you, you, you hit uh, them at the beginning, at the, at the acute stage, uh, the, uh, the, the lower the probability that you will have this lingering population. So that in principle makes sense, yes. Yeah, I've always thought that it makes most sense to intervene when you know that someone has, has gotten an infection right away to prevent the infection from being able to become more chronic in a sense um, by intervening early on, I suppose, like that is a, a, a decent model for that. Um, with Borrelia and this, when you talk about persister cells, that's also related to biofilm formation as well. So I, you know, for example, there obviously are people who understand that organisms can form into in a small, simple sense communities in which they're protected by a matrix. How do, how does biofilm and persister cells, uh, how is that intertwined? Right. Well, they are, you know, pathogens where the, this has been properly studied, including in my lab. For example, uh, the staph, staph aureus, uh, will form uh, biofilms on indwelling devices, such as, you know, catheters and heart valves, or will cause, uh, you know, infective osteomyelitis, so it's infection of the bones, a nasty, nasty chronic infection. Very hard, very hard to eradicate. And so uh, biofilm is a, uh, is kind of a, uh, a a blob of cells, if if you will, that covers themselves uh, with an exopolymer, and that exopolymer makes it difficult for the immune system uh, to get in uh, and kill, let's say, the remaining persisters. The antibiotics do diffuse uh, into a biofilm, uh, but they don't kill persisters. So essentially, a biofilm is a protective environment uh, against persisters. But uh, what, what we did, uh, you know, th th there was this debate uh, in the field of, uh, of biofilms, I I in the case of pathogens where the biofilms are clearly prob problematic, there's no question about it. And there has been this, uh, you know, debate for, for quite a while. Uh, you know, a lot of my colleagues in the medical profession uh, felt that, uh, you know, persisters are a curiosity and are really irrelevant and uh, the crux of the matter is that they felt that uh, the pathogen is hiding somewhere uh, in the body, 
in a place uh, inaccessible to antibiotics. Uh, and so, uh, so we actually resolved that, uh, that issue uh, by doing a model experiment in mice uh, where uh, there was a biofilm formed by staph. And now we have this you know, compound ADEP I mentioned to you that kills regular cells and cancers. So we, uh, so we introduce ADEP and we get ourselves a sterile mouse. We kill the biofilm uh, in the mouse. That tells us that the antibiotic, antibiotic actually reaches the biofilm. The problem is that regular uh, compounds are not effective yeah, in killing the biofilm. Interesting. Okay, that's a that was a good experiment. Um, yeah, in terms of this with with a biofilm, you know, when you say, and I I experienced somewhat something similar where uh, sometimes people are not really open to the possibility that biofilm is forming in a patient with a given chronic infection. Um, one of the things I've always thought of is the the oral community, for example, with P. gingivalis in a, in a tooth, right? It's well understood that if someone gets a cavity or something like that, that it's a collective process, that we have, for example, P. gingivalis is a dominant organism, but that it teams up with other organism and that leads to cavity formation in a simple sense. And then we don't give people with cavities antibiotics. We actually understand to some capacity that we have to break the biofilm up, even brushing, flossing. Do you think, how come that community seems to, for example, um, you know, embrace the idea of biofilm um, and other communities have not so much in other body sites. Well, it, it, it all really boils down to the evidence and how easy it is to gather such evidence. Uh, so, so for example, in in the uh, carrier or gingivalis, it is very easy to, to, to observe that there's mm -hmm. a biofilm in the tooth. You know, it is okay. visible to the naked eye. Uh, actually, uh, or let's say in a, in a dwelling device, you pull out a catheter from a patient and it's covered with what looks like slime, right? You put it under yep. the microscope and you see, you see that by, it's very easy to see with osteomyelitis. Uh, so, so there are cases where there is there's no question that there is this mass of cells easily observable. And then there, there are other uh, diseases where that is, uh, you know, uh, where the evidence is really comparable. The evidence is just not there. Um, so, uh, you know, a good example is actually tuberculosis, where uh, you can form, the cells will form a biofilm, you know, on, on a Petri dish. Uh, but then there, there isn't really evidence that that is happening in the body. And the same, the same with Borrelia burgdorferi. Yeah, you know, I'm not con I'm not convinced based on what I've seen uh, that there is a biofilm formed by Borrelia burgdorferi in the body. Interesting. And why not? It it wouldn't it seem that if you were a Borrelia and, and the quorum sensing right, so they that does Borrelia you know admit some signaling molecules right that are tied to biofilm formation, um, but, or why not? Why wouldn't Borrelia? Oh, there's no there's no theoretical reason why it should do it. It's just. Okay. I, I, I'm saying the evidence. Is but the like, evidence, I get what you mean. I mean, it's definitely, yeah. I, I get what you're saying. It's much easier to study the mouth or a body site that you can easily collect samples from than an internal tissue or a, whatever, where it becomes more of an issue to, to establish that, especially from a, a living person. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right. And then also you've moved beyond just studying the single organisms, bacterial organisms, and the way that they can evade or respond to antibiotics. And you've actually looked at microbiome as well, right? So in patients with post-treatment, uh, chronic long-term symptoms after Lyme, um, you've done microbiome work as well. Can you tell me about that? Uh, yes. So if, if you look at the symptoms of patients with uh, chronic Lyme, they really uh, uh, appear as symptoms uh, of uh, autoimmune disease, uh, so at least overlap with that. Uh, and you certainly have thought about, you know, similarities between uh, chronic Lyme and long COVID, uh, which also sort of belongs in, in the same spectrum. Uh, these are, you know, muscle pain, uh, fatigue, foggy mind, uh, and others. And so, in the areas of autoimmune, well-established autoimmune diseases like um, multiple sclerosis, uh, for example, now there uh, have been very good studies that link the microbiome to uh, exacerbation uh, of the disease. Uh, 
So the aberration of the microbiome is a contributing component to that autoimmune disease because a microbiome is a sort of as an intimate contact with the immune system and can either help or harm the immune system. So, so, so that's, that's probably the link. Uh, and, uh, and there are companies uh, out there that uh, are trying microbiome-based intervention into these established uh, uh, autoimmune diseases. So we thought that uh, maybe a similar thing is happening in, in chronic Lyme. And what we found by analyzing a stool from these patients, these are uh, a well-defined cohort from John Alcott with whom we collaborated on this, um, is that if you analyze the microbiome composition you know, from patients with uh, uh, chronic Lyme, then uh, you see that there is a distinct change that we call a signature, uh, PTLDS or chronic Lyme signature. Uh, and uh, that uh, tells us that this may be a contributing indeed component you know, to chronic Lyme. And, that, uh, and so you know, our working hypothesis at the moment is that uh, there you get a, an initial infection with Borrelia burgdorferi uh, that uh, causes changes in the immune system and affects the microbiome. And then on top of that, you get a broad spectrum antibiotic that further damages uh, the microbiome. And so the combination of these factors perhaps conspires uh, uh, to produce a uh, chronic disease in some patient. Uh, so that's, that's, that's our thinking. That's definitely interesting. I agree, that's, that's logical thinking. You know, so in other words, the organism Borrelia in itself will hold down the immune response as most pathogens do. They'll hold down the immune response to better survive. But as well, you're trying to target with antibiotic, but if it's broad spectrum, it can kill off a huge number of organisms in the gut, some of which, or other body sites, some of which may have been performing important functions. And then you end up with a situation in which the collective activity of the gut microbiome becomes more problematic. Yeah, that's a... And, and do you think that, in, I, I suppose it could be both, but in some cases that the patient may still harbor Borrelia in a small reservoir, and that actually contributes to some of the immunosuppression and the, the stress that the patient's enduring, and that actually allows the microbiome more capacity to shift towards virulence or to a pro-inflammatory state? That's possible, sure. Yeah, I don't know. I guess as there's been some good work with HIV, which is obviously a very, very, very much, uh, you know, takes down the immune response. Um, but once the patients get HIV, it, the immunosuppression driven by the virus, then the organisms and microbiome really start to turn under the conditions of immunosuppression. So that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, cool. And, you know, before I go on. I actually am really interested how you got into this studying these topics. So you actually got a PhD, your PhD in Moscow and Russia, correct? And then how did That's you begin correct. there? So and how did you start um, with an interest in biology and these topics in the first place? Well, uh, moving to America helped, you know, it's mm -hmm. kind of to do science <laughs> here than it, than it was in Russia. Uh, but, but in general, what, uh, what, have, uh, what has attracted me over the years is, is uh, old unsolved difficult problems, uh, right? It, well, within, within the realm of microbiology. So, so I've worked you know, on persister cells, which uh, were discovered in 1944, but there was no understanding of, of their mechanisms. So we made considerable progress now understanding their mechanism. And, and as I told you, getting the first uh, compound to kill them and, and develop pulse dosing at least as, as, as another option. And then uh, we, you know, we worked on uh, uncultured bacteria and uh, figured out the ways to grow them. And, uh, and then uh, uh, in that realm, uh, uh, Lyme disease seemed to me uh, the in, both intellectually uh, attractive uh, problem because it's just so difficult and unsolved and seems to be a very tough one. So that's exactly what, what I like to work on. Yeah, but also, uh, you know, I have uh, seen pa patients uh, with Lyme disease uh, at, at a meeting, uh, at a Lyme meeting, and that uh, sort of also made an impression. We usually, we, we you, you know, scientists in academia who are not MDs, we don't get to see patients. And for us, it's all very abstract, uh, all right? Uh, sure, of course, you know, we're all human. We realize that we, we do something useful that will help. 
But this was the first time that I actually saw patients and, and quite a number of them were not in good shape. And so, uh, you know, that certainly motivates, uh, motivates me and my team uh, to, to work on Lyme disease. Absolutely, yeah, that's great. Um, okay, and interesting now, when you develop new antibiotics, you've actually created a, almost, so some, some bacteria cannot be cultured. So in other words, when you're creating sometimes a novel antibiotic, you actually can use a, a bacterial compound, correct? Which can sort of, one bacteria makes a compound that may kill others. Is that a strategy? Yeah, yeah so yeah, bacteria, yeah. especially let's say bacteria that live in soil. Mm -hmm. They live in pretty yeah. dense uh, communities, and they uh, they compete with each other, and and they fight uh, fight with each other using antibiotics. Right, that's that's their sort of their main weapon, and then we can isolate uh, those antibiotics uh, and uh, and use them for exactly the same purpose. Uh, actually, in the clinic. That yes, that's cool, and you've been able to grow bacteria that don't usually grow in culture how have you done that in order to develop antibiotics yeah that's so, so yeah so this is this is a, a hundred year old problem problem that's the, <laughs> the oldest unsolved problem that i worked on um so it was uh, it was uh, described in, in the 19th century uh, and called the, the the you know the great plate count anomaly meaning that yes. take some bacteria uh, from soil, you know how many cells you have because you counted them under the microscope. You put them on a petri dish, and each cell is supposed to grow into a colony. So you count the number of colonies, and suddenly you're missing 99 percent. <laughs> uh, so you you grow one percent of what is out there. So that's why the great plate count anomaly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so with my colleague Slav Epstein at, at Northeastern, we decided that uh, we're going to do something very simple. Uh, we're going to grow these bacteria where we know that they do grow, uh, which is their natural environment. Mm -hmm. So we came up with a simple gadget you know, where we take bacteria from soil, we sandwich them between two semi-permeable membranes that allow the diffusion of molecules, but not cells, and, and put that back into the soil. So essentially we trick bacteria. They don't know <laughs> that happened to them because they're in full chemical contact with their environment. Everything diffuses into them. So they get all the nutrients, growth factors, et cetera, and they form colonies. So, uh, so that was our method to, to growing them. And, uh, and we have been using that uh, to to find new antibiotics, we actually started the company Novobiotic, and the Novobiotic has taken this to an industrial scale, and now has a very large library of uh, formerly uncultured bacteria uh, that uh, they use to discover new antibiotics. Wow, that's very cool. Um, you know, I, it seems to me like you are on target by trying to develop novel antimicrobials. Um, it, why it, I do see other teams doing this, but it seems like there's less really, uh, less people really trying to develop novel antimicrobials or antiviral drugs. Do you think that's a low, lower priority than it should be? Well, I could not tell you about antivirals. Uh, anti, developing antivirals is in a way easier than uh, mm -hmm. new antibiotics. Uh, you don't have a penetration problem. Uh, you know, a uh, virus is exposed, at least mm -hmm. it, when it's in the blood and even uh, inside the cell, uh, you know, uh, molecules penetrate into human cells much easier than into bacteria. Uh, the, reason, uh, the reasons why uh, not too many people uh, are working on antibiotic discovery uh, against bacteria these days is sort of... Uh, there are two reasons, I would say, two big mm -hmm. reasons. One, it's very, it's very difficult. And if you are in academia, you're supposed to get, you know, grants, uh, grant proposals, and uh, your students are supposed to graduate. You know, you, you want to build a career. Uh, and if all of that is predicated on your ability to find the next good antibiotic, the probability of which is very small, that's not a huge incentive to be working in that field, right? 
you may want to work on something that is uh, much more, where success is much more assured uh, than, than this. Uh, and then, and the industry is not terribly motivated to, to do that because of sort of market reality. Uh, new uh, antibiotics are put on the back burner due to uh, uh, good uh, uh, stewardship practices by the clinic. Yeah, because uh, uh, the the thinking is that yeah, you know if you if you take a new antibiotic and, and make it into the f first line of defense against pathogens, then resistance is going to develop and and it will become uh, less useful pretty soon. So let's keep it on the back burner for only very tough cases. Uh, but by by the same by this token, there are no sales, right? If you're keeping it on the back burner, you're not selling it. You're not selling. There's no market. So that's a double whammy, I would say, that leads to this paucity of uh, new antibiotics. That's very interesting. I never really thought about the fact that that the antibiotics, in other words, would be reserved for special occasion, and thus there may not be enough patients to make enough of a profit. That you know, I I just yeah, because otherwise it seems like we should be making huge reserves of possible antibiotic, um, especially knowing how resistance is a huge issue at this point. And antibiotic, we're in a crisis of antibiotic resistance, um, at least uh, to many people. So, yeah, I don't know. I I hope that there's a way to switch perhaps the, some funding models or some development models in a manner that would more favor development. Well, you're right in that. So England is now experimenting with a new model, now, which is a subscription model, where a hospital pays a subscription price for a new antibiotic. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that payment is, is not, it doesn't depend on how many doses they will use. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it's a flat payment, and a uh, somewhat different model uh, is being uh, uh, sort of is being evaluated in the U.S. Uh, so far, theoretical. The Congress has the Pasteur Act uh, in front of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so if it passes as a legislation, according to the Pasteur Act, the company that makes the next new antibiotic will get a couple of billion dollars. Uh, upfront, uh, okay. sort of, uh, and making then uh, antibiotics uh, competitive to drugs, uh, you know, by profit-wise uh, as to other diseases. Good. I'm glad to hear about that. That makes sense. Um, you know, I'm curious. L form bacteria, is that something that you've studied? Do you think that that's another form of possible persistence for these organisms, or is that not something that you have gotten into? Not, not, a, not, a, huge, not a huge problem, uh, relatively speaking, as, uh, so we, uh, we, we don't work on it. Okay. In other words, the back, sometimes bacteria can sort of lose their cell wall, right? But yeah. do you think that's a transient phenomenon, or do you... No, it's, it's well. Sometimes it's transient. Sometimes it's mutational. Uh, but but again, that has not been a uh, you know as big a problem as persisters, for example, or or mm -hmm. uh, or other forms of resistant bacteria. Got it. Okay. And to go back then just to the persisters, I want to clarify one more time. So you have found that antibiotic can actually often penetrate biofilm, but it's the fact that the cell, the, the individual, the bacteria in the biofilm have formed into this persister state that really is the, makes the, the, uh, the antibiotic not totally work. Uh, right. And, and okay. so the, uh, uh, you know, the problem with biofilms is that uh, they prevent the immune system from reaching persistence. Because if you have persisters in the blood, it's not a big problem. They will be gobbled up by macrophages. Uh, that that uh, makes sense. That's the problem. Yeah, you know, there's a, a number of groups right now developing better Borrelia or Lyme diagnostics. Do you think this is going to be a problem for them, especially for patients who have longer term symptoms that may have some chronic infection? Um, in other words, the it's unlikely over time for the pathogen to be in blood, free floating in a form in blood, and instead it will be more likely to be in biofilm or a persister form. Do you think that mm -hmm. that 
Do you think that that understanding is needed to develop the best diagnostics? Uh, it's not, ne not necessarily, uh, because uh, you do not need to, uh, uh, to directly uh, test for the presence of the pathogen. Uh, most tests uh, actually uh, test for the presence of, let's say, antibodies that are produced in response or, or other consequences, like uh, the study I told you with the microbiome that we've performed, we have a microbiome signature, uh, and there's a distinct uh, possibility that that signature can be developed uh, into a diagnostic. Uh, similarly, there, uh, there are other groups uh, they are working on, uh, let's say, figuring out what happens with a pattern of gene expression, which you, these days you can very easily measure, actually, in human blood cells. Uh, in patients with uh, chronic Lyme as compared to uh, to healthy uh, patients. That is interesting. Yeah. So let me think um, in terms of then um, continuing to innovate on this, what is your lab planning to, what are your, is your lab working on right now? Do you have any specific um, additional ideas for how you're going to keep pursuing this topic? Uh, right. So, uh, well, we have uh, a, a drug discovery uh, effort uh, against Lyme disease, and we have sort of our, our own uh, pipeline uh, of such compounds, and we have our lead now, which is uh, hygromycin A that we recently published. Uh, we uh, uh, are pretty, uh, pretty excited about, and so developing hygromycin A uh, into something that's, that's going to be useful for patients with Lyme disease, that, that is our current focus. That's great. And when you study Borrelia, you obviously studied other bacterial pathogens as well. What have you learned about, you know, you've studied Staph aureus, you've studied other organisms. Um, has that, has the understanding and understanding of Staph or other pathogens helped you better understand Borrelia's activity? Uh, Sure. Well, first of all, what we learned with other bacteria, what we learned in, in terms of drug discovery was extremely helpful, uh, right? We came to drug discovery against, uh, against Borrelia with, a, uh, with an enormous uh, sort of war chest of sort of knowledge and techniques to apply to. And we, you know, rather rapidly uh, zeroed in uh, on the need to find compounds that are going to be selective. Uh, in killing spirochetes, um, and that is uh, uh, what led to to, to hygromycin A uh, and uh, some other compounds that we have in, in our pipeline. So, this, uh, so that was one rather immediate uh, useful transfer of knowledge from other bacteria uh, to Lyme disease. Uh, and then uh, others uh, are certainly understanding of, you know, persisters and pulse dosing. So these uh, ideas came from our work with the staff. Yeah, and can all bacteria form persister cells, do you think, or is this only a phenomenon that's document that's certain uh, bacterial pathogens here? So, uh, so, so based on, on the mechanisms that we, have, uh, that we have uncovered, I would say that all bacteria form persisters. And in terms of evidence, uh, each and every species we and other tested uh, produces persisters. Wow. That's just, it seems like it should be one of the most, and that's why I enjoy interviewing you now. It seems like it should be most, one of the most important concepts understood in um, chronic disease and bacterial contributions to chronic disease at the moment. Because for example, I'm not sure, there's research, for example, in atherosclerosis, right? Where there have been bacteria that have been identified in atherosclerotic plaque. It may not be the whole picture, but there, there are organisms there sometimes that could be part of the disease process. But I've definitely had people say, well, we gave people with atherosclerosis an antibiotic and they, they didn't get better. So the disease must not involve bacteria. And I think that what you've done, which is showing that it's not quite that simple, that one antibiotic given in one instance would be able to um, actually clear up an infection that had uh, organisms that were in a persister form that had be become more uh, biofilm uh, prevalent. Would you, do you think that's holding back the, the, the sort of better understanding of bacteria as a driver of an, 
or, or contributor to a number of you, 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 have to, you have something right. And, uh, you know, going back to the experiment I, I, I told you about in mice that we performed with this compound ADEP, uh, you know, to eradicating a biofilm. It is that type of an experiment that I would love to see performed, uh, if you will, in, in, in people. Uh, with, uh, with uh, first of all, with uh, such compound and then with other compounds uh, in cases where, uh, where we suspect that the bacteria may be contributing, but really do not, do not know. Because you see, so far it's, it's been extremely difficult to test or prove a negative. Let's say uh, you do not think that Borrelia burgdorferi is present in patients with chronic Lyme. Well, how do you how do you prove that? You know, uh, uh, it, it, it is very difficult since uh, you cannot take you know a sample of blood and culture Borrelia uh, out of it. So uh, I think as we uh, and others move move forward and we get more compounds to kill. Persister cells not only in staph but also in gram-negative bacteria, uh, and uh, and uh, in Borrelia that that will be helpful. Now, speaking of that, there is one compound that that kills persisters in in, in our hands kills persisters of Borrelia, uh, and that is uh, disulfiram. Uh, disulfiram. Uh, so, so it has a non-specific mode of action. It doesn't hit one defined target. That's why it's so effective in, in killing. It's also fairly selective against spirochetes. We do not understand yet uh, why it's relatively ineffective against other bacteria. Yeah, but, uh, but unfortunately, disulfiram has some side effects, right? It was developed uh, as a drug to treat alcoholism. And I thought it would be pretty safe. Uh, but now experience with patients uh, is showing that, where well, patients with chronic Lyme is showing that uh, it, you know, it, it has quite a number of, of known side effects, just, but, but this is not a trivial matter. It is a concern. So ideally, I want to have a, a compound that uh, is selective and, and kills persisters without obvious side effects. Yeah, no, I mean, of course, that would be the the dream. Um, although it still is uh, interesting that you were able to identify disulfiram in the in the first place as being so a, a good target. Okay, and in terms of finding, trying to actually just better study this uh, possibility that patients may have a low level of Borrelia related co-infectious organism in them over time if they have chronic symptoms it seems like we have to collect more samples than blood, right? We'd have to collect tissue samples and other types of samples in which the organism would be more likely to persist over time. Sure. Okay, yeah, that's one of the things that just seems straightforward to me is we do a lot on these patients. We do a lot of blood work, um, which is common with most diagnoses. Um, for example, I work on another diagnosis, myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome, which is often started by a viral infection, but the viruses involved are often neurotrophic, and so they have a preference for nerve. And so over time, if you really want to see, figure out if they're still there, you have to get samples with tissue or nerve. So it becomes a, it, a, a sort of real, and that's one of the things, it takes real effort to do that, which is why sometimes it can, you know, you don't see that happen as often in, in research to make the effort to get that tissue. Do you think, would that be interesting if, if someone was able to um, demonstrate persister um, or biofilm formation in a tissue sample. Is that something you could work on in the lab to then say, oh, look, if there it is, can we um, use this information to better understand how to apply antibiotic? Uh, sure, I, I would say uh, the, the most critical question is probably even, even simpler. And that is, uh, can we confidently detect uh, so Borrelia in patients with chronic Lyme. Yeah, definitely ongoing challenge, but something that we're trying to work on. We're trying to collect tissue samples and we're going to see what we can do with some of our whole genome technologies and also with the mix of other methods. For, to yeah, that, that, goes. that is a, an, an extremely worthy endeavor. <laughs> I agree. It's probably it's a it's a long it's a be a long process, but it's something that we do feel should should be should happen. Well, then this has been extremely interesting. I overall 
your work has just so much applicability to, as you, the lived experience of patients. You're able to better understand the way that organisms are actually behaving in patients. And then you're able to use that information to create antibiotics or antibiotic regimens that make sense in concert with the way the organism acts. And I do think that that is something that more labs should emulate. And I guess my last question would just be, do you have any more uh, things that you would add, uh, advice to other teams trying to study these topics, for example, let's say there's another lab that's getting into Borrelia antibiotics, what would you tell them as advice if they're getting started? Uh, it's, well, that's, uh, that, that's a tough one. Uh, usually, you know, it, it is, it is uh, pretty straightforward, uh, you know, in science. You have uh, curiosity, uh, and that leads you to questions. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you work on, on getting answers to those questions. Uh, that's, that's how science works. If, if you have natural curiosity and ability to answer questions, you, you'll do just fine. Uh, uh, that, that, that would be, that would be uh, yeah. advice, cultivate your curiosity. I agree. And, and and in my and I think make generating hypotheses that make sense to test you know, a hypothesis driven approach is usually helpful once someone has started to think along those lines. Of course. Of course. Well, great. Well, Kim, then that's it. I think it's really um, interesting and I look forward to your continued work on not just Borrelia, but other bacterial organisms and their ability to survive and contribute possibly to chronic disease processes. And as you know, I think we should be developing many antibiotics. So I'm very glad that at least you're doing that um, and that hopefully maybe more labs or teams will take inspiration from that work. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye then.